other because we share a new life in Christ. We have experienced the new birth. We pass from death unto life. That's what he says there in verse 14. And that word past uh, demonstrates the condition that uh, this life, that it's permanent. As recipients of everlasting life, Christians are bound together as family members for now and eternity. You know, so whether or not we as believers get along with one another, we're going to spend eternity with each other. One, one evidence that a Christian life a Christian has a new life is found in the world's hostile attitude toward them. I don't know if you noticed lately or not, it just seems like the world is really coming down on Christians. I mean, we hear so much negative talk about Christians. And the fact that the world hates Christians, it confirms the truth that we don't belong to this world. We shouldn't be surprised, the Bible says, if the world hates us. Remember what Jesus said over in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Let me read that for you. It says, if, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, you would love the world as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And certainly we see how much the world hated Jesus, enough to nail him to a cross. John had just had done explaining here in verse uh, 12 about Cain. Cain committed the first murder in this world. He says, do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain detested his brother so much that he murdered him. And we also see then in verses 14 and 15, the principle of love. The principle of love. Verse 15, he says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So this is the second foundational principle here of the principle of love, getting along with one another. You know, the absence of such love is a strong indication that a person is unsaved. They're under the sentence of death. He says there in verse 14. Anyone who does not love remains in death. See, two children of God cannot possess a hatred for their fellow believers. True children of God will enjoy times of fellowship with one another. I, I trust all of you enjoy, look forward to Sundays when we come together, and even times throughout the week when we can get together. That's really all we have in this world, I mean, is, is our fellowship with one another, because we know the world is against us. Genuine love is tremendously important as members of God's family. You know, and it also gives the world evidence that God is at work in our lives. See, whether you realize it or not, the world is watching us. They watch how we treat each other. They watch how we treat others that are unsaved. They watch how we react when people are hostile against us. You know, and here in the book of John, 1 John, uh, he uses a number of words over and over again. He uses the word love. He uses the word fellowship and know. And this word love, in the Greek language, there was actually four words used to distinguish between romantic love, family love, friendship, and selflessness. The word used in this case is agapeo, which is used in the New Testament, referring to that selfless love that Christ had for us when he died on the cross. In fact, Jesus used the same word to call his followers to love their enemies over on the Sermon on the Mountain in uh, Matthew chapter 5. But clearly such a love is not referring only to the emotional feelings 
of affinity we have for one another. You know, we're, even though we're told to love our enemies, uh, that doesn't make them an intimate friend with us. But sometimes it's more of a matter of our will rather than our feelings. We can't always control how we feel toward others. But we can control how we act toward them, how we treat them. You know, we're to treat everyone with respect, even when we don't always get that respect in return. See, you and I are not enemies of each other. We're not supposed to be. In the case of fellow believers, we should find ourselves drawn to each other. We should find that there's a kinship established through Christ. Now, sometimes within families, we know there can be uh, disputes and rivalry. How many of you know brothers and sisters that don't talk to one another in a family? You know, but when it comes to the family of God, we're not to be like that. And unfortunately, I'm sure there are Christians in this world that don't talk to one another, that have a, a hatred or a, a dispute with someone, and they, they just refuse to reconcile. And the Bible tells us that's wrong. The selfless love is supposed to rise above our emotional inclinations. You know, if you find a hatred for one another developing in your heart, it's time to get on your knees. A hate-filled heart cannot coexist with a heart filled with God's Holy Spirit. One, one is motivated by death, the other by eternal life. And John is saying here, you know, if you, uh, if you hate, how can you call yourself a Christian if you actually hate someone? The writer here says, uh, hatred desires for the death of another, even if it never carries out the act. According to John, a person who hates a brother is a murderer. And again, he says that in verse 15. Hatred is a root cause of murder. Think of all the murders that are committed in this country. Just every day. And why do people do that? Hatred. There may be some other underlying uh, reasons, but you know, it all comes down to hate. You hate someone that much that you want to kill them. The writer here also says that the one who hates doesn't carry out the hatred by actually murdering someone, but that doesn't change their motive. See, God knows the motive of all of our, our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. And he will judge a person by their motives. A person whose life is characterized by hatred is not a member of God's family. And yet we know God can change hearts. We praise him for that. Think of people in, in prisons who've committed murder, but they've had a change of heart. God has gotten hold of their hearts, has changed them. You know, I, I hear so many instances of that. Uh, prison fellowship is, is giving testimonies all the time of people whose lives have been turned around. And only God can do that. God can plant that divine love in a person's heart. When we go on here then to see the practice of getting along in verses 16 through 18. John writes, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. You know, the, the principles of life and love that we just looked at here, um, 
they will manifest themselves in two ways. These characteristics will ensure that believers get along in the family. We see uh, John talking here about sacrifice. 1 John 3.16, compare that to John 3.16. They're very similar. In both cases, the outcome of God's love for us is Jesus laying down his life for us. But 1 John 3.16 goes on to insist that we who are followers and imitators of Christ should sacrifice for the brethren as well. Christ's sacrificial death presents the perfect picture of the kind of love that we should have toward one another. You know, a loving Christian is willing to sacrifice for their fellow Christian. And that may even mean your life. You know, and I have to ask myself, am I willing to lay down my life for someone else, for another believer? But it even goes beyond that. We see the sacrifice of Christ. It was sufficient once for all. There's no further need for Christ to give his life. His sacrifice was sufficient for all time. But I believe here when uh, believers are exhorted to lay down their lives in verse 16, the verb tense indicates that they ought to do it continually. You know, there's, there's Christians every day in this world that are giving their lives for their faith. Some are giving their lives for other believers, maybe to protect a loved one. But beyond the real possibility of having the privilege of, of uh, making that ultimate sacrifice for our brethren, we see there's uh, more to it in verse 17. He says, if anyone has material possessions, sees his brother in need, it has no pity on him. How can the love of God be in him? You know, are we willing to give of ourselves and our pride to help someone else? A loving Christian is willing to serve others. You know, in this life, we may not be called to give our lives for someone physically, but we never know. But there's so many other things we can do for one another. You know, and John talks here in verse 17 about if you have uh, been blessed materially, be willing to share that with others. He says when these people see a believer in need, their response demonstrates what kind of love they have for God. If they refuse to offer comp uh, compassionate assistance, they show the principle of love is not in them. You know, sometimes people just offer lip service and don't actually do what they should be doing. He talks there in verse 18. He says, Dear children, let us not love in words or tongue, but in action and in deed. You know, as I said, we have many opportunities in this day and age to help others. We're seeing right now the great need down south with the, the hurricane victims. People can help out in so many ways. Uh, experience missions. You've heard that before. They're packing 171,000 meals over the next three weeks. We can have a part in that. We can demonstrate our love to those that are less fortunate. We also see here the proof of getting along. Verses 19 through 24. He says, this then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. You know, no matter how strong your faith is, uh, 
at times in the position of the, the family of Christ, uh, things can seem uncertain to us. Our faith might seem uncertain. You know, John talks here about, uh, he gave indicators of our lack of faith, hatred, failure to support those in need. And, uh, but then he's also giving us, a, we can have assurance that God is not done with us yet. We won't fall out of his grace because we, we've sinned one time too many or we've committed some error and we, we can't get by it. God's word makes it very clear that the believer's salvation is assured and secured. You know, as we read these verses, uh, we can think, it, think of our lives. We can think of failures that we've done over the years. And we can also ask ourselves, even right now, how much love do I have for my fellow brother in Christ or sister? Am I serving the Lord? Am I using my gifts and talents for the Lord as I should? John gives us some uh, proofs here in these next few verses that we can be assured that we are part of the family of God. He talks here about a clear conscience, verses 19 through 21. Verse 21, he says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. You know, many Bible teachers believe that John was using the word hard here uh, but he, he actually meant also to be talking about our conscience. Sometimes our conscience condemn us. They rob us of assurance. Rob us of that assurance that we belong to God. And it says here, God is a better judge of our lives than is our conscience. Sometimes our conscience might be too strict or too lenient. But God is greater than our conscience. We can depend upon what he tells us in his word about our eternal salvation. If your conscience isn't clear, if, if there's something there harboring your fellowship with the Lord, then it's time to confess that sin before the Lord so that you can get right with him. The word of God teaches that our salvation depends on his faithfulness, not on how we feel. You know, we as believers look at our lives in light of the principles found here in 1 John 3, and we can be sure of our salvation. God knows the problems that we face each and every day. His promises will meet our doubts and alleviate our fears. The clear conscience will bring us confidence before God. Verses 22 through 24, and then he talks about the proof of prevailing prayer, continuing to pray. He says that we will receive anything from him, but now you've got to look at what it says here. We have to obey his commands and do what pleases him. I like what it says out here in our sign about prayer. He answers sometimes yes. Sometimes no, sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to see, well, what is God saying to me? What is he teaching me a lesson here by having me wait? The essential condition to the promise of our receiving from God, whosoever or whatsoever we ask, verse 22 all that we do, including what we ask of God in prayerful petition, must be pleasing to him. You know, God is never going to give us something that's contrary to his will. Because that would amount to sin. But the key principle here is not in our asking whatever we may will, but rather in conforming our will to God's in whatever we ask. When God's will and the believer's will are in harmony, the believer's prayers will be answered. When our purpose in life is to please God and keep his commandments, whatever we ask, 
will be in accord with his will and what he wants for us. So in conclusion here, John comes back to the the central commandments that are the sum total of all that will be pleasing to God. And that is having become true believers in Jesus Christ. We have to be all about the business of loving one another. This commandment here, uh, verse 23, relates to our believing in the name of the Lord Jesus. To have faith in all that he represents. We accept without reservation all that the Bible tells us about him. The commandment also includes having a love for the brethren. He says in verse 23, And this is the command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. You know, this last verse here gives clear evidence of one's abiding in Christ. One who abides in Christ keeps the commands God has given in the Bible. As we daily keep his commands, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are indwelled by him. So whenever doubts start to creep in, and they do in all of our lives, sometimes we, we doubt our faith sometimes, we, we doubt you know, we say, what is God doing? Or we wonder whether our faith is valid. We need to just recall that it's God's Holy Spirit in us who gives us the ability to keep his commandments. People whose lives measure up to the description found in these verses are assured they dwell in God and God dwells in them. And that's what he's saying there in verses 23 and 24. If we're obeying his commands and we're seeking to please him, then we know we're in accordance with his will. You know, we as Christians can stand confidently before God, not because of anything we've done, but because our Heavenly Father has accomplished everything for us. So what does the love in the family of God look like? I want you to think about that this week as you go through this week. How can I demonstrate love for others? Is there more that I can do than I'm already doing to demonstrate that love for one another? Loving the family of God is a a major part of, of God's will for every believer. As I said, when his will and our will are one, He says we're going to receive what we ask. All right, that's all I have for this morning. Uh, Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again we say thank you for your precious word. Thank you for revealing once again to us our need to love one another. Just as you loved us and sent your only son to die in our place. I pray this morning if there's any listening that that have never put their faith and trust in Christ, never realized that he died personally for them, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts, would show them the way of salvation, show them their need to put their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Father, I pray this week that you would continue to teach each of us things that we can do to show love for one another, to demonstrate that love, not just in words, but in action and in deed. Thank you so much, God, for loving us to death, the death of Jesus. We pray this in the powerful name of Christ. Amen.